can't even see the audiences here. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Aren't they the best? Okay. <laughs> so um, it's so nice to have you here. And I've, I'm like thrilled that you came out in the rain to talk about dogs, which is my favorite subject. I'm Kitty Boone. I work for the Aspen Institute. Um, Dr. Horowitz first came a couple of years ago uh, for one of the more popular sessions we hosted at Aspen Ideas Festival about um, animals and spoke about dogs then, and we're just thrilled to have you back. Um, I want to start, I can't really see, so I have to go like this, but um, how many of you have a dog? <laughs> I figured. <laughs> Why else would you be here? Well, I am the... Um, very happy owner of two Labradors. And um, when we uh, get into questions, the only way you're allowed to ask a question is if you state your name, your dog's name, and your dog's breed, just so you know. <laughs> we just need to know. And Dr. Horowitz is a researcher. She talks a lot about names, so it could be a really interesting um, conversation considering my current dog is named Trout, and that's not on the most popular name list, just so you know. So, um, this is part of the annual Summer Murdoch um, by Mind, Body, and Spirit series, and I really want to thank Jerry and Gina Murdoch, who are the new parents of three-month-old twins, but nevertheless, um, I doubt are here tonight. And um, they made this series possible, and they've done it for several years, and we just so appreciate their um, generosity to us. And just quick note that when this is over, over here, we will have a book signing with um, Dr. Horowitz, and I know you're going to want to buy the book if you haven't got it already. So Alexandra Horowitz, without going into great le length here, is a researcher. She got her um, BA in philosophy at Penn, then got her doctorate in psychology, uh, is an associate professor of psychology at Barnard, and runs the Horowitz Dog Cognition Lab at Barnard, and I just thought, um, uh, before we get started, I just <laughs> really was reading your bio and thinking, how did you go from being a philosophy major to a dog scientist? <laughs> so That's welcome, a, and thanks so much for coming. Thanks, Kitty. It's, it's a total treat to be here, and thank you all for coming out. And I wonder if there are any dogs actually in the audience here. Maybe. We'll hear. We'll hear if there are. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Uh, yeah, you know, there weren't, there wasn't such a thing as dog scientist when I started my studies, right? And, and it's actually still a kind of a funny phrase, dog scientist. Um, but when I did philosophy, I was interested in questions of mind. You know, how do we know about mind? And then later I decided to study cognitive science and bring some kind of more scientific approach to that. And I was very interested, I got very interested in non-animal, non-human animal mind. Um, and I think I'd always had a sensitivity about animals, but I didn't think I'd study them, right? I didn't want to be a vet. There was no other way to study animals. Um, but when I got very interested in non-human animal mind, I thought, well, there's got to be some behavior that they do that can tell us about what they know or understand. And I got, thought play behavior would be the behavior I would study. Well... I was looking at non-human primates, because that's what everybody studied. You study chimpanzees, you study bonobos, you study our closest relatives, because they're the likeliest ones to show something similar to our minds, we thought. Meanwhile, I was trying to find bonobos and chimpanzees who were playing, and they play, but not, not when you're watching, often, <laughs> and they're not always av available. And meanwhile, I, I lived with a dog, Pumpernickel. And I was taking her out to the beach in San Diego, where I was in graduate school, several times a day. And she was playing. And it took me about six months before I realized I should be studying that species. That's the playing species. And something about play will tell us about mind, just as it does in infants, right? In young children, when they play, they're like learning to be people, learning to interact with others. 
And so suddenly I was studying dogs, um, studying dog play. What a great gig. But um, when I finished my dissertation, I realized I was, I was more interested in dogs, qua dogs, than I was in you know, what, was, what was play telling us about their mind. I just wanted to know everything about dogs. And it was right when there were a few other people around the world, like Brian Hare, who was here last mm -hmm. time, yeah. uh, thinking about dog mind, and we all at once became dog scientists, and now there's actually a big field of, of dog cognitive science. I'm, I'm impressed. So now you can be an undergraduate major in cognitive science and, and study dogs. And I don't know if it's all scientists writing these books, but if you really want to have a library of dog books, you will exceed the capacity of the largest library you can get, because there are so many people that write about dogs, um, stories about their dogs their thoughts about dogs. We're gonna get into it a little bit. Mary Oliver's wonderful dog songs, poetry about dogs. Um, so, so I just thought it would be interesting for you all, because we've all emerging from this pandemic, I hope we're emerging from it. Um, uh, and as we talk about the culture of dogdom, um, it seems relevant to share some statistics with you. And I just thought it was interesting that um, what happened during the pandemic was that, you probably read about this, is that pet adoption just went pretty much off the charts, so much so that there were shelters around the country that were out of dogs and cats. And um, something like 891,482 animals, cats and dogs, were adopted in 2020. And of those, 452,000, oh, just about a fair split, were dogs. And the other interesting statistic that this person reported who was talking about this um, was that the number of foster dogs went off the charts to close to 55,000 families or people fostered animals in 2020. And um, I just wanted to ask you, so it seems to me that there are a few reasons why somebody would have adopted a dog um, or a cat, but a dog, let's just keep focused. Um, <laughs> Emotional support, companionship, and licks. <laughs> and I just want you to respond a little bit. I mean, is that what it's about? Is why you think everybody adopted dogs? So many. Now, it's not that we don't adopt dogs all the time. We do, but it just seemed like it just went off the charts in the last year. Yeah. Well, I think it, there was this fascinating phenomenon that happened, and I think mostly for the good for dogs, which was that we suddenly re-saw the value that they are in our lives, right? We all knew how valuable they were in our lives, but suddenly it was brought into stark relief. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, the, as you mentioned, the emotional support, but the licks too has a, a true component to it, right? We were not able to contact other people, but who can we contact and be in touch with all the time? You know, it's it's our dogs, right? They will suffer our petting them nonstop. They want to be by our sides. They want to always be in the room we're in, touching us, laying their head on our lap or our foot. That kind of contact kind of, I think, served as a proxy for human contact when we were alienated from each other. So at some level, I think people realized this is the place that they have in our lives and we want to bring more of them in. And then people thought, oh, I have a lot of time. This is, you know, it is a great idea to bring a dog into your family when you're at home and can slowly acclimate them to the, the world of humans and maybe the world of humans when you're not at home all the time eventually. But that is an ideal time to bring dogs into our home. So, I think it was our appreciation for them, a realization that as a species, they are our uh, perfect companions, even in the time, the worst time, you know, that we might live through in our lives. So we talk about the relationship with dogs and humans, but let's go way back for a minute, way, way back, thousands of years back. Why, you know a lot about this. Can you talk a little bit about how humans started connecting with dogs and, and what it was about the dog that became, became the most domesticated animal. Right. Way right. back. Well, we don't have perfect, the perfect answer to how it all started, but there are a couple of theories. And we think it's at least 14,000 years ago because we have archeological evidence of people, of, of dogs buried with people um, that far back. 
So there are a couple of possibilities. One is that people, um, dogs kind of self-domesticated, wolves sort of self-domesticated themselves. Do wolves who were less fearful of humans than wolves are naturally, mm -hmm. started approaching places where people lived and found that there was this great resource around people, which was that we uh, had started generating trash. It was a great food niche for them. They could eat that trash. Some of the puppies, the wolf pups, might have been taken in by people and raised, and sometimes even eaten at the time, but maybe raised to adulthood, and then slowly we started breeding them. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that from the get-go, humans intentionally selected this species, some wolves who were, again, slightly less fearful than other wolves, and started specifically breeding them to be companions, but to be guards and hunting companions more than anything. Mm -hmm. And so why wolves? or dogs, these proto-dogs, over any other animal? Well, I think there were a couple of reasons. One is they're social. So they have a social life that's similar to our social life in that they live in family packs. We live in family packs. So they have allegiances to members of their pack. Some of these animals had a lot of behavioral flexibility so that they could view not just other wolves as members of their family pack, but also a non-wolf species like humans. And so they could, if they were introduced early enough into our family packs, could see us as part of the family and behave like they would to members of their family. That's another thing. And then eventually, as we started breeding them, they had attributes that we really desire. And one of them that's talked about a lot in, with dog scientists is that they look at us. They follow our gaze. So. If you're out in the wild and you see, you're out for a nice hike and you see a bear, what the bear is not doing, it, you hope, <laughs> is looking you in the face, right? If they are, that's a bad sign. That's a threat, right? It's, and you want to get out of there. But similarly with a wolf, gaze, direct gaze is viewed as a threat. And that's the case with most animals, non-human so animals. A wolf even today, a wild a wolf. A wolf even today, right? But what, not with us, right? I mean, I wouldn't stare at somebody I don't know, but making eye contact mm -hmm. is, is the predicate for understanding. It's how we communicate with each other. It's how we show affection to each other. It's, it's a show of cooperation and respect and understanding. Mm -hmm. And these early dogs probably were able to look at people's eyes. And then they could start to use that eyes, those eyes for information, start to understand what we were saying, follow where we were pointing to get information about what was around them. And then they resembled us. Then they seemed like us. So they took, maybe accidentally, maybe through our domesticating them, an early step which made them perfect companions for us. But you also, which is I just love about the way you write about it, they transformed us as well. And you say in kind of a profound statement that the domestication of dogs actually changed the course of human sapiens, homo sapiens. Yeah, there's even a theory that we, we could be considered sort of domesticated ourselves, right? <laughs> Alongside with dogs, that we became more even-tempered, more cooperative, that some of the things we do now in the 21st century are a result of our transformation just, at, just in line with the dog's transformation. And what did that domestication do to us? Did it make us more simpatico? I mean, how do you think it, how did it, how did it change us? I mean, clearly they became helps in hunting, so maybe it moved us along the food chain a little bit, but what did it, I know what dogs do to me. I'm just curious about, you know, 10,000 years ago, how we evolved slightly differently because of dogs. I, mean, I don't want to get too off point, but yeah, well, it's interesting. Well, uh, you know, my colleague Brian Hare talks about dogs as the friendly species and, and humans as successful also because we are fundamentally friendly. So he takes a real non-Machiavellian approach to saying that the reason we've succeeded is because of our cooperativeness and maybe dogs pushed us in that direction. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay, wow, oh, that's really interesting. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what bonds mean. Um, you suggest that the dog-human bond is both 
connection, but also built of reciprocity. And that we have a unique relationship with dogs. And maybe we've talked about this a little bit, but what defines that? Is it that they say that when you, when you look at a dog's eyes and that dog looks back at you in the eyes, there's this rush of oxytocin and you fall in love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's true of other animal species, but what is it about human-dog connection that's particularly unique? They, they do seem to have hijacked this system which works for humans, where when you have an infant, um, you know, infants who are very needy, and really dependent and, and require adult help. And really cute. And very cute, but require our help to survive. That just by looking at an infant, we get a rush of oxytocin, which uh, kind of creates a bond, a, a parent-child bond. Um, and dogs have seems to have hijacked that system. So that similarly, when we look at dogs or when we touch dogs or pet them, um, we get that rush of oxytocin. So that's maybe the neurological foundation of the bond. But I think the bond is the feeling of mutual understanding and cooperativeness and affection, right? That's, I think that's the core of the bond, that we see something, we see our better selves in dogs, and we want to be affiliated with them, and they suffer affiliation with us. <laughs> <laughs> And, and we both wind up with this attachment and affection for each other. And different kinds of people have different kinds of attachments to different kinds of dogs. Yeah, I already mentioned I'm a Labrador person. I am sure there are a million breeds of dogs represented by people in this room. Are different kinds of dog breeds different in the way they attach to humans? Well, it, it's certainly the case that dogs are our mirror in some respect, right? And, and some people, there have been these fascinating, these lovely studies, a little off your question, but that people look like their dogs, right? Oh, I was just going right? to say, yeah. <laughs> I totally I mean, believe it. Really, you might have a sense of this, but it actually bears out when subjects are asked to match photos of people in, across cultures, match photos of people with their dogs. They, they can do it at, at, at rates greater than chance. And it's not because, oh, the long, blonde-haired woman and the Afghan hound, right? It's not that. It's like the like noble bearing of a dog and the very regal man or the... Sit up straight. Right. <laughs> I was trying to make myself more <laughs> regal. Or, or a goofy looking, you know, uh, retriever, uh, golden retriever and a kind of goofy looking guy. You know, it's, it's these sort of sensibility issues. So we do, we seem to either pick dogs who we feel like represent us in some ways or Here's my theory is we make ourselves more like our dogs over time, <laughs> a little bit. Um, so there is that matching between people and different breeds or mixed breeds. And we even match uh, dogs in uh, our personalities and our temperaments. So people who are more um, uh, rank higher on uh, neuroticism, for instance, tend to have more neurotic dogs. Okay, okay. Let's <laughs> okay, that is so... Okay, can we just talk about that for a second? I mean, <laughs> is it assumed that if you see a dog that you think is neurotic, that maybe the owner is all of a sudden has some characteristic that you never knew about that person before? Well, I mean, it's a correlation, yes. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying anything about the causal error though, there, but yes, right, the agreeable, people who rank high in agreeableness have agreeable dogs and so forth. So yeah, there is some ways in which our dogs reflect us. One of the things that, that people say to me frequently, and of course it's you know flattering no end, is your dogs are so happy. And I don't know if dogs really smile, but um, are some dogs just naturally happy dogs versus other dogs that are more serious? I mean, how do... Yeah, yeah, sure. They're definitely more serious-minded dogs, although I don't know that... And there are dogs who are depressed dogs, right? I mean, they're dogs who can get into a state of depression. But there are dogs who are naturally more easygoing. And dogs who, I would say, I would use, instead of happy, I would probably use easygoing or um, uh, intent right, very keen, working dogs who you know, have the one thing they need to do and they drive to do it. And are, they don't look happy, per se, unless they're doing that activity. And then they're very happy, right? And dogs who are more easygoing seem to have that temperament no matter what they're doing. What was the book that I read? This is, 
um, I know you're going to know it, about the woman whose dog was, um, was a German shepherd breed who could find um, a, a body. Right, a cadaver, and a cadaver dog. dog. Yeah. And would, has, they're used around the United States to find missing people and can sense, because of their nose, which is, I think about, um, 20 feet down in cement, I believe was something I read, a body. Now, and, and the w interesting thing about getting into that story was how that dog got that job, because the author who had this dog reported that the dog seemed very, didn't, just seemed a little bit neurotic. And the trainer was like, would you give your dog a job? Like, this dog needs a job. And so one thing led to another, and it became one of these incredible cadaver dogs. And it's a particular type of German Shepherd of um, Malinois, I think. Or, yeah. um, anyway, it's just interesting to see. And, and Australian Shepherds, there's one in our neighborhood, a little puppy, who just herds all of the dogs in the neighborhood, just instinct. Yes. It's so interesting to see how they behave. Well, this is what I think is so fascinating about how we live with dogs now, is that you know, many of them were, have been bred for quite a long time to do a specific job, jobs that we're not asking them to do anymore. And we need to give them something else to do. And this is something that people now spending a year in constant presence with their dogs, which, which they might not have before, are seeing, right? That their dog uh, is kind of at, uh, is, seems bored during the day or doesn't have anything to do or needs something to do. And I think that's absolutely the case. It's interesting that we're now seeing it where people hadn't seen it before. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things you write in a kind of hilarious chapter, I thought, was how we speak to our dogs and um, what, sort of how do we speak to our dogs and what does it say about us? And when I was reading this, I was immediately changed the, my <laughs> the way I would speak to my dogs. I'm very, being very conscious of what I'm saying to them. And I, I was sharing with Alexandra that I listen to books when I walk my dogs, and I don't use earphones, so the dogs are extremely well-read. <laughs> and um, really good mysteries, and uh, a little Tolstoy. <laughs> so you ask them questions about what they I read. don't ask them yeah. questions, and if they run away, you know it's a really boring passage now. I'm, um, how, how, tell us a little bit about p what you've learned about how people speak to their dogs and, and sitting in the park in New York City. Right, I mean, I, this was such a fun uh, chapter to write in, in my last book, things people say to their dogs because I think I hadn't really, it hadn't occurred to me how much I talk to my dogs. Even, as much as I am an observer of dogs, I wasn't observing myself sometimes with my dogs, but I would go outside my apartment in New York City and I realized that, you know, you'll see a, suddenly a dozen dogs on the street. And as I would approach people, they would talk to their dog. They would say something to their dog. And I started thinking about that, and then I started writing down what everybody was saying. And then it became, you know, I was like following people, listening to things that they were saying to their dogs. And when people would come into the lab to do studies with their dogs, you know, I would take note of what they said to their dog. And it's, I, first of all, everybody talks to their dog, and that's A, and B is it's wonderful. It's just like, I think it's very lovely that we do. We're in constant conversation with our dogs, and this is fascinating to me since they never respond. <laughs> Sometimes people will respond for them. So there's a whole subway of, peop of people talking to their dogs where they also fill in the dog's voice. Oh, you've got to give us some examples. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, <laughs> you, you want me to do my dog's voice? Yeah, please. No, no, not, no, just like, how they're filling in the dog's voice or well, well, somebody will say like, oh, you know, I mean, <laughs> constantly when people are walking with their dogs, say, oh, um, well, if you don't do your business, we're going to have to go home. And then, they'll, and then they'll wait for the dog to say something. <laughs> the dog says nothing, and they'll say, all right, well, I told you. I warned you about this. We talked about this. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's, well, I know we have to get home. I told you early. So it's back and forth like this. And that's a, a type of way people talk to their dogs. They also, you know, kind of admonish them to, I remember one gentleman walking his dog and he, his dog was being sniffed by another dog and seemed a little shy about being sniffed. And the guy said to his dog, he said, come on, be a man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> it's so perfect. <laughs> and then there are people who talk to their talk um, 
to their dogs as proxy for talking to somebody else. So if there was a disagreement that you and I were having, Kitty, and, and your dog Trout was here, I might say, well, Trout Kitty isn't being very friendly now, is she? <laughs> Right, as a, a kind of indirect way of talking. So that we let them in on this conversation we're having, which I think is, is a beautiful manifestation of how like, deeply they're in our psyche all the times. So they don't really understand the words, but they understand tonality, um, uh, certain commands. What yeah. do you think they understand? Well, you know, there are a couple of mostly... Um, uh, Australian Shepherds who, uh, or Border Collies, sorry, who do understand a lot of words. There have been, you, I'm sure that many of you have read about Rico or Chaser who know a thousand words, a thousand words for toys. So many words for toys that their owners have to write the name of the toy on the toy so they can remember what the word for the toy is. <laughs> Like, bring me that toy, bring right, me... Right, bring me Einstein, bring me Dino, bring me, you know, the Grinch or whatever it is, uh, or, or go touch I Dino, or, and they're, they're terrific at it. But those are dogs who are sort of heavily trained in, in understanding those words. No, it's not their native language, and we don't speak to them in a way that they can understand, particularly, right? If I ask my dogs if they want to go outside, you know, I'll ask them, do you want to go out? Should we go for a walk? Do you want to? Do you need to go do your business? I'll sell lots of different things. They don't, and so it will take a dog a long time to pick up. And what they'll pick up is the sort of tone of the sentence, right? The place where I say that sentence, like my manner toward them. So they're very attuned to the things that we don't think carry the meaning. We think it, meaning is all in the words, but for them, the meaning is on all the other things, all the context, and they're working very hard to understand it, right? But yeah, the guy who says to his dog, be a man, you know, I don't think any of that is communicated <laughs> to the dog. That's, that really makes me laugh. Happily. Can they read our emotions? Yeah, they're very good. They're very sensitive to uh, changes in our emotional state. And there has been interesting research. Um, I mean, a lot of people might assent that when, if you're upset, say you're crying, you're sad, that often a dog will come and provide comfort. And it's not obvious that the dog knows that you're sad and that approach will make you feel better. But in fact, the dog does notice that something's different about you. You're doing something different. You're, you probably are giving off a, a smell that is different than usual, and they're concerned about it. And they go, and, and then their proximity brings you comfort. So they are sensitive to that. Um, there are dogs who can distinguish between faces of angry and happy people in determining you know, uh, whose advice to follow. For instance, they choose the happy person, not the angry person. If you've ever wondered why, when you're angry, your dog like runs away, you know, they're very sensitive to that. So they do understand emotions in those broad strokes ways as, as they have those emotions themselves. Can they also understand when you're sick? Yeah, we smell sick, right? I mean, it's funny because we actually often can detect um, uh, the smell of disease on someone else, but we don't use our nose in that way. But dogs, dogs do. And so, you know, if your dog comes up to you one morning and smells, you know, is very concerned about uh, your, your breath, say, I would say, yeah, that's probably, you're probably getting a little bit of a cold. You might want to have a little more vitamin C that morning. They are really good detectors of difference, and they're very sensitive to smells in a way that we are not, as, as we know, as the cadaver detection how does, dogs How does us. knowing that you have a cold, or frankly, cancer, which I've heard dogs can detect, yeah. how, do that, how does that manifest into a behavior towards us? Well, usually, so the very first cases of dogs detecting uh, cancers were, were accidental. And they were written up in The Lancet and this a medical journal in Britain. And they were both cases where the person noticed that the dog was just being really annoying in a specific way, like just kept smelling my left leg, just wouldn't let me alone. And the other one, it was the armpit, just wouldn't stop smelling at it. After months and months, you know, they would go to the doctor. One of them had a melanoma on the left leg, which was caught and, could, and was removed um, early enough. And the other one had breast cancer. So the dog had just showed persistent interest in the area that smelled different. Um, now, I'm not saying that you should all like look for your dogs to be cancer detection dogs, but the dogs who are being trained to do that, they have very specific alerts. So they'll be asked to sit next to 
the odor of um, disease-carrying cells, for instance, and they're really good at it. I mean, that they can do it naturally. They're only uh, they only need to be trained to be motivated, basically, right? To be interested in constantly doing this, and we have to be trained to listen to them because we're mostly, you know, if a dog was sniffing my knee a lot one day, I'm not I'm not going to think anything of it. But if we knew that they're trying to communicate with us about this, then we would realize that that's something I should attend to. So interesting. Okay, you also spend in your book a really wonderful chapter on names mm. for dogs. And um, so I thought we should talk a little bit about what's in a name. And I, you know, already shared the silly name of my wannabe son's um, thought that someday he would be a fly fisherman. So, you know, I have a dog named Trout. The, the, the problem is that he is the best swimmer and he would swim in a puddle if you asked him to. He is the most appropriately named dog I, I can imagine. But there is a lot of funny things about names and you, you talk so beautifully about names and it's just hilarious. I, and I love thinking about what we name our dogs because, well, first of all, it's a time of great pleasure, you know, choosing a name for a dog. Um, but it's changed, shows something about us as a society, how we've treated dogs over the last hundreds of years, right? Dogs used to all be the kind of uh, Rex spot type of names. Now, most dogs, maybe not Trout, but you have a Jack as well, I right? Have, have, have human names. Um, and not only do they have human names, but often I'm finding that dogs are named after an important relative, right? I ha I've, I've uh, heard about a lot of dogs who are named after a deceased grandparent, just as you might name a child after someone revered in your family, now the dogs are getting that name. And I think this is just ever more indication of how m deeply they've worked their way into our family. That wasn't the case uh, um, 50 years ago, right? It was still the case that they were getting, there were more blackies, this type of name, right? Now it's Charlie, Daisy, Right, um, the top ten uh, dog names are all but one. I think are human names, so I find that to be, and you know, I've really enjoyed. And maybe Trout lived up to his name, right? Because as we sometimes imagine that children will live into their names, um, and often asked to give advice on what you should name a dog, right? As though it were would predestine them to some great future. I just say, just it has to be something you're willing to say a lot. <laughs> that's, well, the, that's the science of it. So you do have a dog, a new dog named Quiddity, which yeah. I, yeah. I think you need to explain a little bit because that is like not a name on the top 10. <laughs> no. <laughs> we have a Finnegan, and up, which is a popular, is, are there any Finnegan owners here? There sometimes is, uh, and at Upton, there are very literary dogs. And um, Aquidity, that was named by, is our new puppy, it was named by my son who wanted to call her Quid, and Quiddity means essence, the essence of a thing, and she surely is the essence of a puppy. So we thought that was a, a perfect name for her. And it, it's not a human name, so I'm bucking my own trend. Um, but she responds to all the other dogs' names too, so that's oh. okay. <laughs> Lots of syllables. I always thought that you should name a dog one syllable. Thus, Jack. Jack. <laughs> but, trout. yeah, and Trout. But I don't like to say Trout, actually, too often. My favorite people's names are ones who have the very long sort of official name, right, in addition to the nickname, right? So they might, their name might be um, Pickles, but his name is actually, you know, Mr. Esteemed Pickles of, of the Buckingham Pickles, the third, right? And they'll bring out that long name at, a, at very serious occasions. Just in the house, they call him Pickles. I, 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 I was just amused. She writes about this vet that's coming out to see a dog for the appointment, and the dog, he's looking around, and finally he looks down at his list, and he goes, Brussels sprouts? <laughs> <laughs> like, who names? I don't even... I, I hate Brussels sprouts. <laughs> I had never seen a more Brussels sprouts looking dog than this dog, though. Well, what so. does that mean? It's not green and shriveled up, is it's it? It's very cute. It's a little tiny round creature. <laughs> oh, it's really funny. Do you, so there's no really advice you can give this crowd about how to think no, about just names. something you, I mean, 
it's, there, you know, some people will say you want something that's um, distinct from the other words you're going to say, right? It's going to begin that language that you use that you want the dog to understand. You're going to put the name at the front of it. So you want it to be in some way distinct. But I think it just should be something that's meaningful to you that lets them be part of your family, just as you would name another member of your family. Mm -hmm. um, does my dog love me? <laughs> I mean, how do we know that dogs... There's no question that we all love our dogs. I'm sure of that. That's why we're all here. But do they really love us back? Like, what does that look like and feel like for them? Right. Well, you know, what's interesting is that until very recently, it's scientists would be loath to say that dogs love. Why is that? That's because we think that any kind of emotive word must be anthropomorphizing. And I do think it's important not to over-anthropomorphize, in other words, not to assume that dogs just are having the exact same experience as we are. But if you look at dogs' behavior, there's no other way to describe most of their behavior towards us than affection or love, right? I mean, the uh, looking for you when you're missing, the huge, excited, enthusiastic greetings when you return, the wanting to be near you, the feeling distress at being separated from you, kissing around the face, responsiveness to you, all of those things are kind of evidence of love. What does it feel like? My guess is it feels very much like what it feels like for us, minus some of the intellectualizing that we do about our love relationships. Um, you've all seen those incredible make you cry videos of the parent coming home from Iraq and the dog just going bananas and hasn't seen that person for a year, which makes me ask about memory yeah. and sort of these remarkable stories of dogs traveling 200 miles or 2,000 miles to get home. I mean, it's really fascinating behavior, but what's built into that dog's instinct? That we still don't really have a way of proving that a dog has an autobiographical memory, but all meaning they sort of sit around and think about their life the way we think about our life, right? I mean, they have the time. Are they ruminating on that, that trip they took to the dog store? But we know they remember. They remember people. They remember places. They remember roots. They remember components of things that have happened that we might not have been aware of, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I love about those sometimes those videos where somebody's returning home, especially someone who's been in the military, so they've gone quite a long time, is that sometimes you see this kind of feature of the dog-human relationship, which we don't think a lot about. Sometimes they're not recognized right away. The person gets out of the car, and the dog barks, right? Isn't sure. It's just a person getting out of the car, maybe in a uniform. But then, like, the wind changes, or they get close, and the dog can smell the person, right? So not only do they have a memory, and that's when it all changes. That's when they go bananas when they've smelled. So I think a lot of their memory is in smell. And if you think about your smell memories, I mean, if I asked you for your earliest smell memory, it's probably very evocative, right, of a whole scene, right? Just the smell of talcum powder. And suddenly my grandmother is there, it, you know, sitting around this horseshoe table that she had, and she's cutting up tomatoes and and mayonnaise because she liked to serve tomatoes and mayonnaise. And it, like the whole thing is right there, just at the smell. And my guess is that for dogs, smells are similarly evocative, but of, uh, you know, of everything, not just in these punctuated ways that we have a couple of distant smell memories, mm -hmm. but that their memory is made up mostly of smell memories. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, can dogs be humiliated? Yeah, we were talking about this before because dog costumes. <laughs> Because that came up. And, I, and, and dog costumes are part of, you know, how do we treat dogs? I, I think one of the reasons we want to live with dogs is because they are animal, because they are other. And yet there's something familiar about them. And I'm always very confused when we treat them like ersatz humans, right? Where we, you know, give them birthday parties. That's fine. But, or we dress them in elaborate outfits. Okay, but sometimes, you know, you do see in the dogs this real reluctance. And I think there is a level of humiliation in being put in costumes and forced to being trotted out, this uncomfortable costume they can't control, 
is pressing down on their body. Their dachshund, who's now a hot dog, <laughs> right? That I, I think, I think it is. It's, it's, it's interesting to me because people who do that love their dogs. Love. I, I have, but no question about it. But it's not necessarily respecting the dog's point of view. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we've got to talk about the leash. Um, I was either your book or another where the author talks about the sense of smell and maybe it's you, right? Is it in your book? Is it this one? Yeah. Um, where by virtue of putting dogs on leashes, one of the reasons they use smell so much, it's, what is it, 200 million sensors in their nose or whatever it is in their nose and we have something like 200,000. I mean, it's like the, the difference in a dog's ability to smell is so much more pronounced than it is in humans. And one of, the, one of the things that could be happening by virtue of putting a dog on a leash and pulling them away from smelling because you're in a hurry or whatever it is, is that they're losing that power of smell. So that's one thing that struck me when you wrote about that. But can you talk to us a little bit else about behavior on leashes and the role of the leash and when to leash, when not to leash, your, your views of the leash? You know, it, probably 100 years ago, people started selling a lot of leashes and dogs were now more integrated into urban communities, coming into houses more, not living as much outside. And it became natural that the way we controlled a dog is with a leash. But I'm with um, Mary Oliver, one of her poems, she talks about the pleasure of watching dogs play off leash. You know, that's one of my great visceral pleasures. I just feel happy watching dogs play together off leash. Leashed dog is part of our current contemporary culture, but there are problems with it. When we put a leash on a dog, we're restricting what they can naturally do. We're re potentially restricting their ability to smell, in other words, to see the world, because we're not interested in their smelling the thing. We're not that interested in the smells that they discover. We might be limiting their ability to socially interact no normally with other dogs, because dogs can behave a little more reactive or aggressively on leash. We instinctively try to keep them away from other dogs as a result, and then they don't get to interact with another dog and just have that normal social interaction that they would. So it's, it's not something which is going away anytime soon, although you know, we'll say there are other cultures where leashes are very uncommon, and they, it still works, right? The way we have chosen is the leash, so I just want us to be conscious of the fact that by putting a dog on the leash, we're circumscribing what they can do, and we're changing their behavior. There's a lot of energy that travels down the leash. There was um, one study of dogs working with their handlers um, in smelling trials, actually, and when the handlers got very stressed, as, as gauged by their cortisol levels going up, the dog's cortisol levels went up, too. It's as though it literally travels down the leash. When we're unhappy, they're unhappy. And so just imagine how much we're bringing to our interaction with our dogs all the time via this seemingly benign, but maybe not so benign appendage between us. We're gonna to get to questions in about a minute and a half, but um, you, you have a lab, it's not really, there's no pun intended, although <laughs> she has a part lab, but she has a laboratory. And, but it's not really, in a kind of a room that people, your laboratory is the world, really, it sounds like to me. Um, you study dogs, what's the ultimate goal of your lab? What, what, what insights would you really love to discover in your lab? Well, what's I guess, the goal? ideally, what I would discover through doing simple experiments, through watching dogs interact with each other in their natural environment, interact with people, is, is what it's like to be a dog. You know, what is it experientially? What does it feel like from the dog's point of view? That's the, that's, that would be the ideal, that I would be able to appreciate their perspective completely, right? So not just say, how smart are they? You know, do they understand what I'm saying? But what's their perception of this room? You know, like, what do they know about their own past and future? What do they know about me that I don't know about myself, right? What's 
their point of view. That's kind of everything that I'm aiming toward. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay, last, I have, okay, I get one more question, <laughs> then I'll, I'll then turn it over to you. If there were one thing that you would love to see dog owners do, what would it be? Well, it might be something you're already doing, but um, I would say it's let them sniff. You know, I, and that's part of a broader kind of let them be dogs, which doesn't sound very profound, but it is because of the many ways we don't let them be dogs. We already control everything about their lives, right? They, when they can go out, when they eat, who they can see, when they can be with us, when they can't, when they can play, when they can pee, when they're supposed to sleep. All these things we control about their life, very few choices. Their world is wrought of smells, right? And, it's, and they love living in that world. So the more that you can, on your walk, let them sniff the thing that they want to sniff once in a while, let them get close to that other dog and sniff that other dog because that's how they say hello, I think the better life they will have. That's so good. Okay, do we have any questions for... All right, there's a woman right back there. Don't forget, you have to say your name and your dog's name and the breed. My name is Joni Weiss, and my dog is Millie and Labradoodle, an Australian Labradoodle. So my question is, when a dog has a sickness, do they tend to hide their pain from us? Right, that's great. That's, I hope Millie is not sick. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that they, so they are sort of naturally stoic. That's partly that they um, may be part of a vestigial impulse from their ancestry as wolves, that to be sick is to be weak, right? And to be weak is to be um, um, a difficult member of a pack, right? No longer helpful in the pack. So you don't show weakness until you have to show weakness. So there might be sort of a vestigial stoicism that we see in our dogs. Um, and also, it's difficult for us to read their expressions of pain. I mean, we have a lot of trouble reading our dogs. Our dogs are great readers of our behavior, but it's, it's very tough for us to s read their behavior. Um, but times that a dog doesn't want to be touched, for instance, uh, a time that a dog moves away from and doesn't want, doesn't go for contact, but wants to be by themselves. I feel like that's partly stoicism and partly just their only way of telling you that contact or touch is difficult for them now. There's I'm sorry. A question over about here. Millie. Yes, in the red. Yes. Well, my dog is is Jackson, <laughs> and. Uh, He's a Maltese, and the thing, he's just mad for food 24-7. <laughs> and so I had somebody, one day I was at the park, and this young girl said to me, well, you know, dogs don't know that they're going to get another meal. Mm -hmm. And I said, they don't? And she said, I said, how do you know that? She said, well, I come from a family of dogs. But I never knew whether <laughs> that was true. And uh, <laughs> But anyway, point being that, I mean, he's, consumed by it at all times. Yeah. So is your question why is that the case? Yeah, I and mean, people say, well, that's a great way you can train a dog, you know, but I mean, then they get big. Yeah. So this is a great example of every dog is different, right? I mean, for many dogs, training with food is perfect because they're ravenous uh, about, f and you know, a dog who is who just has a consumptive appetite, I would say you probably should use a food as a reward because it will be very rewarding, right? You could just restrict her, her, his food, Jackson's a he? Yeah. yeah, his food to just times that you're going on a walk and you want him to stay by your side or whatever it is. I think you could do that. Do they know that they're not know that they're getting another meal? I don't know. I don't, it's hard. I have to be a kind of agnostic about that. But, you know, if you know this about your dog, I would say you should use that then to like create a better life for them. Use it as a reward, punctuate the day with the food, and don't have it available all the time. And he'll learn that it's coming. The next meal's coming. Yes, right here. Uh, 
How do they know all those dogs are dogs? Yeah, well, there are some, and you know what's, I think that's exactly right, but I will put a little asterisk on that and say sometimes very small dogs, other dogs do not deal with as dogs, right? You might have a dog, some people have larger dogs who will chase um, very little dogs as prey. And so there is a little bit of an identification question there, but I think it's, it's mostly through, well, it's through smell and behavior, right? So. Even, even though they're all these different breeds, dogs are way more alike than they are dissimilar, right? Mostly they're differing morphologically in their size or in their face shape um, or in their girth, but they're still more closely related than they are distantly related. And so they're gonna have a similar smell and they do similar behaviors. Um, cats are wildly different. Not only do they eat different things, right? But they have a completely different genome and that comes with an affiliated smell. What I love about dogs recognizing all other dogs as dogs is that we'll, you know, we'll get a person who has a very little dog and then they wonder, they worry or wonder about what that very big dog will do with them. And usually the very big dogs will sort of um, uh, self, what I call self handicap, sort of make themselves put themselves more on the small dog's level so that they can interact appropriately. So not only do they recognize this as a member of the same species, but they also recognize that, yeah, but we're really differently sized, so I'm gonna have to take it easy when I play with you, which I think is very cool. Okay. Right over here in the front row. Um, Nancy, you don't know a Scottish Terrier or an Olaf. Yeah. <laughs> Bella? Ella, Ella, Scottish Terrier. Scottish okay. Terrier. Uh, so, with regard to letting dogs be dogs, barking, you know, you right. know, sometimes yes. in our culture we feel, or you know, you're in Aspen, and you're like, yeah. don't, don't bark so much. Right, right. Or, and the, the second one was leash. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, I can see how so many people walk their dogs without a leash, and then we always use a leash. So, and that's hard for the dog. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. So what to do about, the, so barking is a great example of, you know, the, you know, not, wolves don't bark really. They barely make a barking sound at all. So why do dogs bark? Probably because of us. In other words, as a species, uh, one thought is that they're trying to mimic at some level human speech. So I find it very poignant that mostly we find barking noisy, right, and annoying because it's probably their way of kind of communicating with us. And there are really different types of barks. And I think we fe can feel differently about barks if we realize that they have different meanings and that they're saying something. It, you know, if a dog is barking and you acknowledge what the dog, you know, a dog is barking in an uh, alarm bark because there's another dog coming up, recognizing that's what's happening. You know, you can even help the other dog's person by saying that, yeah, my dog has identified your dog. That's what he's doing. That's what she's doing. Realizing that it's that makes it more understandable, right? I'm not saying you should just let your dog bark all the time. And I'm saying it's a communication and it has a context. And knowing what it is starts, make it, starts to make it make sense. Similarly with leashes, if you can't have your dog off leash all the time, you can't. But you try to find contexts where that will work for you and the dog and other people and dogs, and you just uh, move into that space as much as possible. So it's just a matter of meeting the dog on their terms, right? As opposed to all, us always bringing our ideas of you should be quiet, you should be unleashed and controlled, and restricting their life. That would be my suggestion. Okay, right here, you had your hand up for a little bit. Uh, yes, right in the back. You've got your hand up right there, yes. Yep, that's you, that's you. Sorry, my eyes don't quite work that well. Hi, I'm Jerry Carr, and my dog's name is Kodiak Bear, but we call her Cody. Cody. And, and it's um, a golden retriever. Um, she has a habit of telling me it's time for her to be fed in the afternoon. I can, you know, usually tell the time yeah. by her going to the bowl and just 
splaying out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she's <laughs> a little aberrant in that regard, I guess. And she also has this behavior. Our, uh, her leash is on a peg that's up here, but she has the ability to, I guess it's on top of her crate, so maybe she jumps on it, but she gets the leash down and tells me that she wants to go for a walk. So, <laughs> yes. I love that you acknowledge that Cody is trying to communicate with you. Yes. <laughs> that is what she is does, happening in both those cases. She does communicate with me right. very well. Yes. You know, those are delightful examples. And, you know, actually, the sort of the telling time telling is, act, is, is not just Cody. A lot of dogs are very on the money about what time they're supposed to be fed. And people say, well, how do they know, right? Like, and they're not clearly, you know, watching the clock. But, you know, everything about their day is usually pretty regimented, right? They're also very sensitive to changes during the day. If you, if you watch your dog all day the way your dog usually watches you all day, you will see that there's not a lot happening. One of the big things that's happening is the meal. <laughs> they know when the meal is going to happen, right? And so they're very, so that's why it's like clockwork. You know, they have uh, circadian... Um, rhythms in their cells just as we do, only they're not as distracted by the other things that make us lose track of time. It's one of the main events of their day. So yeah, that's a gr I'm glad you brought that up because it seems like this extraordinary ability, but I think when you look at the dog's life, it makes a lot of sense. You, you know, you, the concept of time. Yeah. Do dogs know that they've been alone for 20 minutes versus two hours? But some people think that they don't because, um, because each time you get a really great greeting, right? When you come back in the door, you go, you went to do the laundry, like, yay, you're back. Or like, I've been gone for a week, yay, you're back. There was a, a, a research group w who looked at the intensity of the greeting um, when a person was gone for 20 minutes, or I think it was an hour or two hours. And they actually found that the, l the intensity of tail wag w was higher the longer they, that, that the person had been gone. So they are actually marking that there's a difference between those times that you're gone. I'm not sure you know, how subtle it could be. Right back here, sir, you have a question. My name is Jan Bellows. I'm actually a veterinarian. And my dog's name is Riley, a German short hair pointer. Uh, I have two questions. One, when we talk to her, she puts her head to yes. the side, and we don't know what she's thinking. <laughs> and the second, uh, more veterinary-wise, is why do dogs love to chew on things? Humans don't like to chew on things. Right, right. What, what do dogs get out of it? Thank you. Speak for yourself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the head thing is, is, as some people might have surmised, is to hear better, right? So they they um, will turn their head to uh, get another kind of vantage on the scene. Like we might turn, you know, try to move around a piece of art or something to see it in a slightly different way. So maybe your dog is looking for, is just listening for something that's meaningful to them. Um, or maybe there's something that sounds like it's meaningful, but they're not sure. So cocking the head is a really nice example of that. And you, you know, their ears are amazing. If you really watch their ears carefully, they're almost like horse ears. They can rotate all the way around. They, you know, they'll go up and down or flat back against. They're so expressive. But a lot of their movements have to do with trying to localize and understand the sound. So that's probably what the head cocking is. Um, and the other one was about chewing. Oh, well, ch you know, their mouth are the, is their hands. Their mouth has double duty, right? It is the way they interact with things, and it's, it's the agent of getting smells and, and food in water into their body. But as the former, it's just their preoccupation. Do you ever hold on to something, you know, rub something in your fingers, or do you manipulate things with your hands? I think since they don't have that dexterity with their paws, they use their mouth that way. And then there's subsets of why do dogs chew, like when they're teething, right? They're likely to want to chew things, and giving them something which is cold to chew is actually just satisfying in that very literal way. But I think chewing is manipulating the world um, with their agent of manipulation, since they don't have hands. Okay, we have time for one more question, I'm afraid. Right, right here, sir. Yes, you. You, right there. A 
couple of observations. Um, you might, dogs not only have intense smell, but they, their hearing's very intense, except they can slowly lose it like ours. Um, yeah. But I noticed uh, you haven't had time to deal with dogs that service in groups, such as Arctic sled dogs and foxhounds, things like that. That's, I guess, perhaps more complex. The, the sled dogs? The sled dog or foxhounds uh -huh. service, service us in groups rather than singly. That's true. Let, let me, I want to speak to the hearing question, point for a second. Do yeah. we think dogs, so dogs have a, high, a broader range of hearing than we do, right? Um, they, they can hear up to 40,000 hertz, which is the sort of dog whistle um, sound. So actually there's a lot, what I think is interesting about that is there are a lot of things in the human-made environment which make sounds in that range that we don't notice. Like some people um, uh, might be, ha have extra good hearing and notice fluorescent lights, or when a fluorescent light starts to go bad, you notice it, right? But my guess is that dogs are hearing that all the time. That's a sound that's just a constant drone for them because of their sensitivity. But they can't actually hear much further than we do. That's, that's you know, but they're, I, what I think is that they're listening better than we are, right? Given that they have fewer things happening, right? They notice when something happens and they'll alert to it, the car, you know, on the distant road. Whereas for us, with our selective attention to the screen in front of us or whatever it is, we kind of um, ignore those things in the background. So that's the, I think that's the best way to describe how their hearing is more acute than ours. Okay, well, I, I wanna thank Dr. Horowitz for coming and sharing her wisdom. Thank you. Um, I, I thought we would close, if you've got one second, maybe you could just read one of the lines from Mary Oliver and know that we do have a book signing right over here. But if you're not familiar with Mary Oliver, she wrote dog songs, correct? And she's a, a really remarkable poet, but she was dedicated to dogs and we were talking about her words. Do you have, do you have one that you've, oh, okay. All right, if you don't have the book, I highly recommend it. Thank you, we could talk for hours. We all love our dogs. Thank you so much for coming tonight.